Here we have the Panzer III. This is one of the workhorses of the German Wehrmacht in World War II. This, there were a lot of these, a lot of versions, and this was, this, this was a tank that saw a lot of action, uh, not only in Europe and on the Russian front, but also in the desert. And here we see it in the desert section in desert Dunkelgelb, literally dark yellow camouflage. Uh, now this is the later version which has the long barreled 50 millimeter gun and I've been told to say to explain what a 50 millimeter gun is because apparently some people don't know it's to do with the caliber that distance there the diameter of the hole in the front is 50 millimeters so obviously the the bigger the bore the the, the bigger the shell the higher the volume the heavier the shell and the more bang you get um, now this particular version has been up armored and you can see this on the side here. If you come around the side, you can see that this steel plate here has been added in later. The earlier versions didn't have this, and there's a gap in between. And the gap is actually quite useful because after penetrating the outer layer, um, the shell will be damaged slightly, blunted slightly, might be turning slightly, and so then when it hits the, the main armor behind it, it won't be in such a good position to bite into the armor and penetrate. Um, also, if they're using what's called a heat weapon, H-E-A-T, high explosive anti-tank, it means that the main charge will be detonated by the outer sheet so that the, the focus of the very, very hot gas coming out of the, the, the heat weapon, which is meant to burn its way through uh, the armor, uh, will be focused too far out and it probably won't have the devastating effect. But the main thing is here, this is against mainly against a simple armor piercing shot. Just put more armor on the front because they found that the tanks were too light. You can see also that they were going to do this with the turret, but on this particular version, uh, they've got the mounting for the extra applique armor, but uh, for some reason it uh, never made it on. Now, this is uh, an, uh, an MG, well, it's probably a version of an MG34. This is a, 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 the tank version of the, the general purpose machine gun that the Germans had. And so is that. And so is that up there. Now, this is, this is something you commonly see all three machine guns on. And sometimes on, on the front of the, of the packet of a, of a kit of a tank, you'll have all three firing at once because it looks ever so spectacular. But in fact, this is a rare, very rare to non-existent configuration because that uh, was quite often one of these two. They put it in the anti-aircraft, that's the anti-aircraft configuration. If you're frightened of enemy aircraft, you want a machine gun up the top there, which can be operated by someone with his head up out of the turret to shoot at aircraft. Um, but if that's not what you're worried about and you're in the middle of a battle of other things to think about, then it, that same machine gun will be in one of these two positions. So actually, one, you, you'd never see three all in, in, in one shot like these normally. I'm sure some people grabbed a third one because they could, but that would not normally be the case. Um, up here we have the German... Now then, uh, everyone you talk to says it differently. Cupola, 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 that thing. And you can see that there, there are vision slits in the side and that these ones can be opened and closed so that they're made out of very thick metal. So that is a very well armored cupola. It sticks up high out of the turret, which gives the commander a good all round view. And of course, if he is worried um, about some very close by threat, he can always close it up again. And that became a standard cupola. They were trying to standardize things. So you'll see um, pretty much the same thing on the top of a Panzer IV and certain other German tanks because they were trying to standardize. Now, there's something called a shot trap, and there's a very good example of one here. Beautiful welding, by the way. The Germans, the Germans are very proud of their welding. These are crafted to last. They shouldn't be. The Germans crafted things to last far longer than the war was ever going to last, so it was a waste of time. But anyway, beautiful welding. I think you'll agree. So if a tank shell comes in at this angle like that, this is a shot trap, because even if it doesn't penetrate, it's going to bounce down and it bounces down into a weak point, into the join between the turret and the hull. So uh, shot traps uh, are something that uh, tank designers after a while learn to avoid. Uh, but here we see an example of one. And uh, I can't see exactly why this particular one existed. Sometimes on some tanks you, you have to have a bit like that so that when the turret turns, the corner of the turret doesn't knock into something. Um, I suppose if you, if you had a box here, for instance, that might have been a problem. Um, but really, the shot trap is something that tank designers uh, try to and, and should have tried perhaps more often to avoid. Now, I don't know if you've seen the film Saving Private Ryan, but in the film Saving Private Ryan, Tom Hanks gets his Tommy gun, runs up to the Tiger tank and puts it into the vision port of the, of the driver and shoots the driver uh, through the front of the tank. But you can't do that because there's a, as you can see, you can see quite clear on this one. If you come, come, come close, you can see because it's actually been cracked. It's been hit by something pretty substantial. There was a socking great big block of glass there. You can't just poke a Tommy gun through the front of a tank. 
You know, the Germans thought of this. They thought, but what if someone, what if Tom Hanks comes along and pokes a Tommy gun through the front of the tank? What if, what if, well, there's a block of glass there, okay, so you couldn't. In the side of the turret here, you have a, an, an escape hatch, or, well, it doesn't have to be an escape hatch, just a way of getting in and out of the tank. Um, and if you were picking up ammunition and so forth and wanting to pass it into a tank, this was a convenient uh, place to have it. Though, of course, it's a weak point in the armor. All hatches are weak points in the armor to be avoided if you can. Uh, I believe that flap there might actually be an ejection port for spent cartridges. Um, that, sometimes called a, a, a bustle, but. It, this is really a turret bin. A bustle um, sticks out the back and you can put things into it from within the tank, but this is really just a storage bin welded along the back of the tank. It's a convenient place for putting your, your coat or whatever when you're, you're trying to fight. And yes, oh, you would need, in, even in the heat of the desert, you're definitely going to need coats because it gets very, very cold at night. Being in the tank uh, in the desert was not pleasant because it gets so hot during the day and so cold during the night. You see loads of photographs of, of guys looking pretty miserable in trench coats and balaclavas. In fact, I would say that most of the photographs I've seen uh, are of people fighting in the desert are guys very well wrapped up indeed. Ooh, oh, it's perishing. One difference between German and British tanks is that German tanks usually, not always, but usually had their sprocket wheels at the front. This is a sprocket wheel. You see it's got big teeth and these engage with the links of the track, grip it and pull it round. It's at the front, which means that in a tank like this, which has the conventional layout with an engine at the back, it means you have to have a great big shaft coming the whole length of the tank, uh, which then has a, a transmission at the front, which has one advantage if it's in front of the driver, so it gives a bit more protection for the driver, uh, but does use up a lot of room in the tank, and that then engages with this. One advantage of this is that um, this bit of track here, engaging with the teeth, is likely to be a little bit cleaner than if you do it the other way around because this bit of, of uh, track here bumping over these wheels will be shaking all the dirt off as it does so. So all this mud that gets caked into the, uh, into the tracks down here is carried to the back of the tank, then all going well and much of it is shaken off. So it's a reasonably clean track that's being engaged with here at the front. Whereas on a British tank, typically, Again, not always, but typically you have the sprocket wheel at the back. And uh, this is a debate which is better, uh, which hasn't been settled yet. So there are modern tanks today which have them at the back and modern tanks with them at the front. So one advantage, one big advantage, is that you don't have to have a shaft going all the way through the fighting compartment of the tank, taking up lots of room. Um, and everything can be a bit more compact and you can get the drive wheel at the back. But it does mean uh, that the drive wheel is get, getting an awful lot more gunk on it um, and so it wears out a bit quicker. It's a German tank but it has the sprocket wheel at the back. If you do have to carry spare track and really you should be carrying some spare track because track breaks quite often, um, a good place to carry it is here on the front of the tank simply because it acts as more armour. You're going to have to carry the weight anyway so you may as well put it where an enemy shot might come in and that gives you just a bit more protection at the front. Now you can see these lines of welding here. So you've got a slab of metal there, welded to a slab of metal there, welded to a slab of metal there. This is a different construction method from the one used in the very early World War I tanks. Those had a framework to which were riveted plates, whereas this has no framework. The, the body of the tank is made up of its shell, so the slabs welded together are the strength of the tank. The outer shell, the box that is the outer armour, is also its own framework, if you like. These are not added to some pre-existing skeleton, some scaffolding within it. This was a new way of making tanks. The Germans had two main tanks which they were going to use to drive at the enemy, the spear point of their blitzkrieg tactics, the Panzers III and IV. And at the start of the war, the Panzer IV had a short-barreled gun that was firing high explosives uh, at, in support of the infantry attack, and the, uh, the Panzer III was the tank for taking on other tanks with a, an armour-piercing based gun. It did fire high explosives as well, but its main job was to fire armour-piercing to take on other vehicles and, and the like. 
they actually swapped roles. They were very similar tanks in a lot of ways. And today, um, a, a country probably wouldn't have developed two separate tanks. They would have just gone for one main battle tank for doing both jobs. So by the end of the war, a lot of these actually had shorter barrel guns, and these ones were firing high explosive in support of infantry. And the Panzer IV had become a main gun tank uh, with a 75 millimeter long barrel gun uh, for taking on the enemy. It was the, uh, it was the Mark F, uh, which uh, changed from the short to the, the long on the Panzer IV. Uh, th this is also an upgunned version from an earlier one, which had a much shorter 37. So this is the more powerful version, uh, the late Desert War version of the Panzer III. <laughs> okay, I couldn't lean back any further.